So one really good thing and one really bad thing just happened. The good thing being Lost in Space Season 3 just came out, but the show also ended and Season 3 is the final season, which is the not good thing. As someone who was stuck with this show from the beginning, I wanted to talk about the newer Lost in Space universe now that we can look at everything in its entirety. But to get specific, today I wanted to present you with a comprehensive guide to the robots in Lost in Space. Talking about SAR, aka Second Alien Robot, Scarecrow, and perhaps the most creative name out of the bunch, Robot. Oh, and before we begin our journey into the world of space exploration, alien planets, shameless product placement, and robots, I gotta send out a warning signal telling you that there is going to be spoilers ahead for seasons 1 through 3. The alien robots were created by an extinct alien species. We don't know too much about this species, in fact, we don't even really know what these aliens look like, because they are as gone as the dinosaurs. The only way we can determine what they would look like is by examining their skeletal remains found by Will Robinson on the alien's home planet, as well as analyzing the robots themselves, as it's suggested that aliens made the robots in their own image. One interesting detail I picked up on was when Will picked up the skeleton arm of the alien and used it to activate each button on the keyboard. The hand on the skeleton arm only had three fingers on it, and the skeleton ended up having four arms. The only time the robots have three fingers on each hand is when they're in attack mode. This could be implying that the alien's hostile nature is what led to their eventual downfall, eventually causing Sar to revolt and tell the other robots to turn on their creators. The plan Sar executed to destroy the home planet of the alien species consisted of stealing an engine, or just a ship, containing an engine, then activating said engine on the planet itself, rather than activating it in space where it's safe and no one gets hurt, because the danger Will Robinson part of activating the engine on a planet is that the engine rips open a wormhole in the fabric of space. To this day, the alien's home world remains a prime example of a successful ground activation of that engine, after SAR successfully used the engine to blow a hole in the side of the planet, destroying the atmosphere and killing all life. Well, except for this valley where the Robinsons, 94 children, decorated astronaut Grant Kelly, three other astronauts in cryotubes, and this French teacher were able to semi-peacefully live for less than a year. The engine destroying the planet was a huge part of the robot's attack, but the rest of the species was taken out in a similar fashion to how the robots attack the Resolute. The exact time of the collapse of the alien civilization is unknown. However, the leader of the valley colony, Judy Robinson, claimed that the rest of the planet died a long time ago. Anyway, let's quickly talk about the robot's features and how they operate. To start, one of the most impressive attributes is their superhuman strength, which makes these already towering giants that much more intimidating. And speaking of intimidation, the robots can mimic noises, like the English language, hence Danger Will Robinson. And they can also mimic animal noises to intimidate and deter predators. The robots can morph from having four arms with four hands and three fingers on each hand to a two-armed, two-handed robot with six fingers on each hand, thus making them look less scary. All four of their hands have the ability to heat up, and when the robot is red and all four arms are out, each hand has the ability to generate and spray this molten hot material to shoot at and severely damage their target. This ability is also great for welding the Resolute back together as it's flying through space or freeing frozen astronauts from ice. The material that glows inside the robot's head is red when it's hostile and blue when it's friendly. Although, the robot can express signs of peace and curiosity when it's red. And speaking of red, the robots can scan a person with a red beam that traces the particles, chemicals, elements, etc. that a person has encountered throughout their life. This allows the robot to see every single location that person has traveled throughout the universe. As Marine Robinson put it, it's like they can follow your cosmic trail of breadcrumbs. When hostile, the robots are more likely to use their ability to take out radio communications. The robots are also capable of tracing biosigns and any electronics that are powered on. As John Robinson claimed, having an electronic still on is like smelling blood to them. The starry face of the robot, as well as its insides, glow as blue as the bioluminescent algae we see on the beaches of the water planet in Season 2 Episode 1, Shipwrecked. The technology that makes up the robot is also the same tech that makes up their engines. You know, the, the big doomsday engines. Each alien ship is equipped with an engine that has the capability of traveling through space faster than any speed imaginable. The engine
engine can form a steering wheel to pilot the ship through space. Or if the ship already has a steering wheel, like this one right here, the engine can be stored safely behind closed doors. Because the robots are made out of the same tech that makes up the engine, the robots can communicate like telephones and trace each other's signals across the universe to reveal the other's location. The same way the engine can show the pilot any part of the universe in real time, explaining why Will and the robot touching the ship at the same time caused them both to see the robot's memories of attacking the Resolute. This also explains how Robot and Will were able to maintain a connection with one another after getting separated. So because Robot had the same ability as the engine, he could see what was happening with Will. As some of the cave paintings Robot did on the Amber Planet depicted Will's experiences he had without Robot. But going back to the robot's face, we know that the robots can communicate with the lights on their face, and we know they have a written language. And then later on, on the Amber Planet, we see a flashback with Sar and Robot having a conversation. This reveals to us that there is a spoken language amongst the robots. Then later in the series, Will records the sounds of this alien keyboard before it gets destroyed, giving him more than enough information to learn the actual language of the aliens and the robots, so future human robot exploratory groups can better communicate with each other. Other alternative uses for these sounds would include Dr. Smith using playback of the sounds from the alien ship to reactivate robot, and Will using similar sounds from the alien keyboard to defeat Sar. Before the collapse of the alien race, they used the robots to expand outward into the cosmos, as we saw that their energy collecting structures were on the water planet, the amber planet, and robots home world. Each ring contains the symbols that are written on the robots. If you can match the symbol on the robot with the symbol on the ring, and place the dead or dying robot on that part of the ring during the lightning phenomenon, you can recharge the robot or bring it back to life. On December 21st, 2044, a robot that appears to be Scarecrow scanned Grant Kelly when he was in cryosleep on the Fortuna. By the way, this also means that Grant Kelly is the first astronaut who made it to Mars, the first astronaut to make it out of the solar system, and the first human to make contact with aliens, and here I am at my desk eating pistachios. The robot saw Grant Kelly's trail of cosmic breadcrumbs and traced it back to Grant's origin, which is Earth, thus sending Scarecrow on a hostile mission to our planet, which resulted in the second human encounter with the robots during the event of the Christmas star, when Scarecrow crash-landed on Earth at approximately 9.37 Pacific Standard Time on December 25th, 2044. The Christmas star was originally thought to be a meteorite, as the ash cloud from the impact reached all the way to Europe and the Middle East within one week. At the time, scientists like Marine Robinson claimed that the astronomers and other scientists working at NASA should have gave them months worth of preparation for the Christmas star's arrival. And she became even more suspicious when there was no additional fallout from the Christmas star. Fallout that you'd supposedly get from any other meteorite, speculating that it wasn't just a meteorite. Her doubts would later be proven right, as the Christmas star turned out to be a crash-landed spacecraft piloted by an alien robot. You know, one of those situations. Dr. Ben Adler reported to the crash site to lead a team of researchers and scientists on the Christmas star project. The alien robot, also known as the pilot the team discovered, would later be known as Scarecrow. That name was given to the robot by Dr. Adler himself. Their government sent in this team of researchers to obtain, deconstruct, and understand how this alien technology works so they could integrate it into their own space exploration vehicles like the Resolute, which is why Marine Robinson and her team who designed the Resolute were tasked with making sure that the Resolute structure could withstand traveling through space at high speeds, like up to 276,000 miles per hour, which is pretty incredible knowing that the universal speed limit, the speed of light, travels at 671 million miles per hour, so it's pretty close. Okay, it's not that close, but still impressive given the fact that the fastest speed any human has traveled through space was during the Apollo 10 mission, when at one point during the crew's return from the moon, they reached a speed of 24,791 miles per hour. Anyway, the government. The government covered up the fact that the human race came across this alien spacecraft, one of their engines, and oh yeah, this big ol' alien robot. Dr. Adler has a lot of commonalities with Will Robinson, as Adler always wanted a robot when he was a kid, inspiring him to pursue a career as a researcher in artificial intelligence that would later lead to him being put in charge of the research project involving Scarecrow. But his initial approach to communicating with Scarecrow was grossly mishandled. First of all, naming the robot Scarecrow is the first dozen red flags, as from the beginning, Adler lacked trust in the robot and was afraid of it, causing him to take drastic measures like creating the 
EMF devices to lock Scarecrow in a cage. Adler's misguided and hostile approach led to an overwhelming amount of unique scars covering his entire body. The same kind of scars that were given to Will and Angela after they were attacked by Sar and Robot. By the way, Scarecrow attacking Will after Will tried to help it was most likely because of present company, making the idea of trusting anyone in that room a really hard thing for Scarecrow to do. Also, Will having this distinct survival scar from a robot isn't a good look for him, as Scarecrow could identify someone with a scar like this as an enemy. On top of the EMFs, it appears Adler and his team spent more time trying to tame the robots rather than trying to peacefully communicate with them. Adler's team discovered that the robots have this built-in way of being disabled or controlled by either another robot or a human-made device connecting to the back of the robot's neck tends to deactivate it. Electricity, by the way, is also an alternative to disabling the robot, as the only reason this generic sci-fi team of guards were able to take down robot was not not by punching, but by zapping. Also, I saw that some people were a little confused that John was punching the robot after Will got stabbed in the heart and was doing all that dying. Specifically confused about the dad saying that they put their trust in the robot to protect Will. But John was never mad at the robot, he was mad at himself. He never really put that burden of protecting Will on robot. Before their journey to Alpha Centauri, John and Marine were separated to the point where she requested to receive full custody of the children. John felt the weight of becoming an absent father and spent this series trying to become a father again and be there for his family and protect his family. So this emotional outburst is him just projecting his own frustrations with himself onto Robot. Besides Robot, Sar appears to be the most free-thinking and sentient robot out of the bunch, as he's the main one calling the shots. Sar started this war because the robots needed to free themselves from their previous owners. Sar's mission from the beginning was to wipe out anyone who tried to take control of the robots, so that could be why the robots were initially the ones to attack Earth, and then later going after Alpha Centauri. But to be fair, the first Earth attack could have been Scarecrow following his original programming, as we know the robot's previous owners must have not had the best intentions. Will Robinson was number one on SAR's most wanted list, as Will supposedly took control of Robot and did the very thing SAR was trying to prevent. However, the one thing Adler and SAR got wrong was their approach to commanding the robots. Will helped Robot out, and subsequently showed him his humanity. Sar wanted to kill the masters, only to later become one. Robot is known to mimic the behavior of its supposed owner. Will initially thought he could tell Robot to do anything, and it would carry out that order, which was true. But at the time, the only reason Robot was blindly following Will is because it wanted to belong, and was wanting to help Will the same way he helped him. The robot's desire for a sense of belonging simply adds to the unexpected and growing complexity of these robots. Robot became a bodyguard to Dr. Smith and a friend to Will, because Robot will help what it considers a friend, that friend being someone who's willing to unselfishly help it, like piecing it back together even if it just tried to kill you. Penny and her robot Sally prove that all a person really has to do is show their humanity to a robot to get it to turn peaceful. In Season 1, Episode 10, Danger Will Robinson, the moment where Robot remembers Will, was one of the first major steps to breaking its old programming, as it was able to bypass everything to protect Will's solely based on their connection and friendship. I feel like this is the moment where Robot became more free and sentient than ever before. Because when we see Robot in Season 2, he's more independent, as he's making his own decisions and not listening to Will. Once freed from their old programming, the robots were able to grow and learn. We already saw this growth with Robot as he placed a stone for his fallen horse friend. The same way Will and John Robinson stacked 27 stones to make a monument for everyone who lost their lives on the resolution. This is showing us Robot's growth and empathy. One of the most important features that I almost forgot to mention is the robot's ability to use the ring to transfer its energy, parts, and consciousness into another being. In this case, Robot transfers his entire consciousness through the parts that he used to repair Will's heart. Robot did this knowing that Sar will misinterpret a metaphorical change of heart as something literal, misunderstanding that the gesture of Robot pointing at his heart was symbolic of empathy and growth that would subsequently change the robots, and that this change was not something you could access through the literal heart of a human being. This maneuver allowed Robot to connect to Sar and override him, completely erasing Sar and giving Robot a new robot body. And that's everything I had to say about the robots in Lost in Space today. I really like Season 3. Uh, I have a poll on my channel right now if you want to participate in it. Here's a screenshot from the current results. You know what? Comment below.
below and tell me what you thought of season three. Did you like it? Did you love it? Did you uh, think it was adequate? And if you want to see any character explanations, like me focusing on Dr. Smith, for example, let me know. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in my next Lost in Space video. Thank mm -hmm. you.